welcome you in our historical hall for this symposium, which is at the same time a tribute to Larry Weinskrantz for his fascinating and busy research on blind sight and a very high level meeting which is exploring beyond blind sight to offer a more general perspective on awareness, emotion, and action from its neural roots. I'm not competent on this field, but I'm very curious and expecting to learn from all this day. Some years ago, I was impressed by a paper by Tamieto and De Gelder, both are here, on the neural basis of the non-conscious perception of emotional signals. And I hope to understand it, its developments today to update my very poor knowledge. As president of this Academia delle Scienze di Torino, I like to tell you why I'm very especially pleased to guest this symposium. There are at least two reasons. The first one is to show you the beauty of this palace, and of this hall. And so I have two slides to show you. The first one is right in the building that is from called the College of Nobles. This is all this building is built in. Here there is an old uh, design. And the design of this College of Nobles, originally owned by the Jesuit order, to sold to the Savoy royal family in Piedmont in 9773. Originally owned by this order, but this was uh, attributed, the design, to Guarino Guarini, a very well-known Italian architect who is living in 17th century. The, the second slide is showing what is the side of this palace which was dedicated to Academia delle Scienze, and the other side today is dedicated to the Egyptian Museum that I invite you to visit, which is a very, very well-known and beautiful museum. Uh, see, well, you, you will see it's a building, but uh, it's only the original design. I mean, outside is, is, you can see much better than on this design. But uh, the academy originated, and the next slide will show you, of course, you get it, on this uh, hall. Uh, but before showing this hall, I like to show you the illuminated, illuministic private initiative by the three men represented here, you don't see very well, which are, uh, which are the founder of the, a private, really, meeting on the Torinese Society on 1767. This was a very interesting in meeting between three people. One is one Lagrange, who is very well known. One is not Lagrange, but is another very nice person, I would say, that has the idea to collect uh, people to help the government to, for suggestion of, of, of uh, poli policy of research. And in, in 1759, their studies were published in a journal first named Michelania Philosophica Mathematica Societatis Private Taurinensis, which is interesting uh, uh, society, which is a private society. But the buildings that I was describing before were sold by the government. So in the next slide, it shows you that it was founded in 1783 the Royal, it was called the Royal Academy of Science. And this Royal Academy of Science was officially established by the three men. Lagrange was the first one, and the other two, which is Giovanni Francesco Cigna, who was a, a physician. And Angelo Giuseppe Saluzzo was really a general of the division of 
artilleria, I don't know, it's a name in English, but anyway, it's, a, it's artillery, I think. That uh, they put together also science and, and check whether this really was congruent with the Israel Academy of Science. Anyway, today we have a, a, a very small booklet that illustrates all the activities, but it's summarized in the next slide, where here there are 250,000, not in this hall, 250,000 books, 5,000 magazines, and 70,000 letters, letters and manuscripts, and 2,000 manuscripts concerning history of science. So uh, today is uh, the activity of the academy. I think we must enlarge and open a symposia like that, this one. And the second reason to why I'm especially pleased to get this symposium is institutional in a sense. When I was elected president of this academy a few months ago, actually, I stated that one of my ambition goals should have been trying to promote a better integration of the two classes of the associated, the class which is called of moral, historical, and philological sciences, and set of physical, mathematical, and natural sciences, including biology and medicine. I think that these topics dealt with in this symposium are an exemplary in this perspective, or at least I hope so. And with this expectation, I wish a loving tribute to Dr. Weinskrantz and a very produ productive day for all of you. Thank you. Dear students, dear colleagues, dear speakers, as head of the psychology department and on behalf of the Chancellor of the University of Turing, today I'm well, I'm really proud to begin this one-day seminar with Professor Weinskrantz and some of the most famous neuroscientists and psychologists worldwide. Last week, my department has offered to Professor Weinskrantz the honorary affiliation by virtue of his brilliant, excellent, and extremely long scientific career. Today, we honor him also with the sigillum, uh, the mark of the University of Turing. It's a real pleasure to be here with you, and I take this opportunity to thank colleagues and students here present. Again, I must give a particular thank to Professor Tamietto for the idea and uh, for the realization of this initiative. Thank you. So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, as a director of uh, the Neuroscience Institute of TU in the Interdepartment Center of uh, Neuroscience, uh, I really thank uh, the organizer, Marco Tamietto, for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful meeting uh, and uh, to Professor Weisskamp uh, to, to be here uh, to, uh, to celebrate uh, his anniversary, anniversary with, uh, with us. And uh, uh, I think that it's a wonderful opportunity for all neuroscientists in Turin uh, to, to gather such a, a group uh, of uh, wonderful uh, neuroscientists. And uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, all the, the young students, especially which are uh, in the uh, in the audience uh, will uh, take a great profit of this opportunity. So thank you for coming uh, and uh, congratulations for your uh, amazing career and achievements. Thank you. Well, all right. Science is a wonderful thing if one doesn't have to earn one's living at it. But sometimes this job dispenses warm and pristine pleasures as the one I have today in giving this uh, honorary speech uh, to Larry Weisskans in front of such a distinguished audience. It is customary when introducing the recipient of a prize or award 
to say that the person needs no introduction or the reason for the award, no explanation. I must confess, I've been tempted to do so. This had granted me three or four more nights of good sleep and had spared a few minutes of your time and attention now. But in the end, I made up my mind that the two honorary fellowships we are given today to Larry Weiskens will benefit from a slightly longer and more detailed motivation. This not to reiterate the obvious fact that Larry is universally recognized as one of the founding fathers of neuropsychology and system neuroscience, but because his career, scientific career, has been extraordinarily rich, distinguished, continual, and long. And while being so, Larry's discoveries and contributions have spanned across different topics and even disciplines. Hence, in a time where interdisciplinarity is often claimed, but rarely actually pursued, I believe that those who know of Larry for the vantage point of one discipline or topic do not necessarily know how influential he has been in others. Well, concerning length, you can have a look at the academic children of Larry listed in Neuro Tree. Well, there is no way to see them all in a glance. You have to scroll to see them all. And the quality is as important as the quantity, as they are eminent scholars by now. As for the continuity, I will not dwell here on tedious bibliometric indexes of productivity, though I could do it longer than you can imagine, because a personal anecdote can be even more apt. In March 2015, after a couple of weeks I had moved to Oxford for a sabbatical year, Larry asked me whether I was interested in joining him on a new collaborative project. Of course, I accepted enthusiastically, figuring out it must have been something on vision along the lines he pursued in the last decades. Instead, it was a project on the auditory system, but more precisely on subjects experiencing tinnitus. He had an original theoretical view that having tinnitus is an auditory equivalent of having a phantom limb, an empirical test relating the tonotopic profile of hearing loss with the frequency of experience of tinnitus, and had already established contacts with a center where to recruit patients. Well, nothing surprising of those who, for those who know Larry, who at the time was only 89 years young. Concerning the richness of Larry's scientific inquiry, I would like to focus briefly on three discoveries and their impact, all topics that will be more detailed and covered in the symposium of today. The first one was reported in Larry's PhD thesis which Larry got in 1953 at Harvard under the supervision of Carl Prebrim. And the results were then published in 1956, as you can see. Studying amygdala lesions in monkeys, he discovered that the effects of amygdalectomy is to make it difficult for reinforcing stimuli, whether positive or negative, to become established or to be recognized as such. In other words, Larry Weiskans first demonstrated that the famous Clover and Bussy syndrome could be produced by a damage restricted to the amygdala. Following this early study, amygdala lesions in humans and animals revealed a strong conservation of functions across disciplines and across species. And it's nowadays virtually impossible to mention emotions without referring to the amygdala and vice versa. A simple search in the web of science crossing these two words returns more than 80,000 papers. Well, not a bad start for a young scientist, and not for the amygdala, too. The second major discovery was in the domain of memory. Amnesic patients cannot remember even important events from one minute to the next. More than 40 years ago, Larry and Elizabeth Warrington devised an ingenious procedure to test retention indirectly now known by every psychologist as priming. Using this priming technique, they were able to show that patients could indeed learn and retain new information for days and even months, but without consciously remembering that this learning actually took place. The ability was still there, but it was out of mind. 
of the patients to use the fortunate title of one book by Bert Gelder. Results have literally changed contemporary views of memory system and were so surprising and counterintuitive to be vigorously challenged. It took several years to go beyond the initial skepticism, but now evidence of retention by priming or classical conditioning in amnesia is something of an industry and acceptance appears universal. Last, but certainly not least, blind sight, of course. It was out of animal research that the story began, when in the 1960s, Larry was studying the effects of visual cortex deprivation in the monkey Helen at Cambridge, helped by Nick Humphrey, who was his PhD student at the time and recipient of the Mind and Brain Prize last year here in Turin. When a patient with surgical removal of V1 came to his attention, the now famous patient DB, Larry was set about using with him the same approach previously used with monkeys. In fact, the patient was not asked to give verbal reports on his conscious perception, but to act toward the stimuli or perform forced choice responding between alternatives. The outcome was an exercise of incredulity, both to experimenters and to the subject himself when it became clear that DB could correctly discriminate between a wide variety of visual properties, such as shape, position, orientation, or motion, or stimuli, it literally could not see. The term blind sight was introduced in 1973 as a light-hearted title for a seminar in Oxford. He has come to enjoy sufficient usage to find its way on the Oxford Concise Dictionary. And LN has also its independent entry in the Oxford Companion of Consciousness. Blind sight discovery has elucidated the extent of visual abilities remaining after loss of V1. But it did much more than this. Blind sight offered an unprecedented opportunity to combine human and animal research, to bring neuroanatomy, physiology, and psychology closer to one another and has inspired countless works on philosophy of mind and consciousness. Well, incidentally, blind sight has also fascinated generations of students all over the world, including one student of psychology in this university. I made him wish to become a scientist one day, but this is another story for which Larry carries no direct responsibility. For his inspired and imaginative leadership, Larry received countless honors and awards. Just to mention some of the most prestigious, Larry is a member of the National Academy of Science of the United States, fellow of the Royal Society, Huglin Jackson Medalist from the Royal Society of Medicine, William James Fellow of the Academy of the American Psychological Society, honorary doctorate at Tilbury University, and many, many more. All this should make clear enough why Larry will be honorated will be nominated Honorary Fellow of the Neuroscience Institute of Turin in a few minutes, as soon as I shut up. But Larry will be also nominated Fellow of the Department of Psychology. The reasons above count for this fellowship as well, of course, but there is an additional one. Despite his outstanding contribution to neuroscience, Larry remains indeed, first and foremost, a psychologist, and as such, he has always defended and purported the leading role of psychology in the study of the mind and its neural basis, albeit in a collaborative enterprise with neighboring disciplines. With his own words, psychological phenomena are the ultimate object of explanation. The explanation of something does not eliminate that something. Psychology sets not only the limits, but the actual directions along which inquiries from other disciplines should proceed. To those purporting that his discoveries have supported a reductionist approach to mental functions in terms of neural operation, Larry simply replied that we do not reduce to their domain. They must elevate themselves to ours. And we must elevate ourselves to embrace their contributions and their interests. Mutual interaction and mutual elevation, not reduction, are the ideals I seek. 
Larry has always been curious and open toward new methodological or conceptual advancements, but never prone to the fashion of the moment. So in the 80s, the golden period of cognitive sciences, it was critical about the disregard for the properties of the real nervous system and those easily seduced by the conceptual nervous system and claimed that an abstract theory can make correct prediction but still be fundamentally wrong. There is an easy assumption that hardware can be ignored, but the distinction between hardware and software is not categorical. Are Hubel and Wiesel orientation neurons soft or hardware? When not making scientific discoveries, Larry has enjoyed some relaxing social activities. For example, he established the Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford, which was previously an institute and then headed it for 25 years from 67 to 93. He was the founding president of the European Brain and Behavioral Society. And here, all the words count. It was a European society, not British or Italian society. It was not only brain, but it was brain and behavior to come together, people interested in both sides. He was honorary president of the European Society for Philosophy and Psychology and founding president of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. So far, Weisskranz, the scientist and academic. But some of us today have also the privilege to know Larry, the man, and enjoy his friendship. More than anything else, the words of those who work with him, almost invariably eminent scientists, can illustrate the point. From a random selection, Larry, to say that this essay could have not been written without your help would be a false and misleading understatement. You taught me virtually everything I know about brains and behaviors of monkeys and how to study them. It is only having left your laboratory that I have realized what a depth I owe to you and that the standards you set for us are far above conventional contemporary ones or another one from Susan Iverson. During the last three years, I have had the privilege of working under the supervision of Dr. Weisskranz. I cannot thank Dr. Weisskranz for all that he has done for me. I came to physiological psychology from another subject and he patiently guided me into this new field. At all stages of my research, his advice and criticisms have been invaluable and I have gained immeasurably from his wisdom of experience. As for me, I can tell you I spent my first wedding anniversary with Larry Behan de Gelder and patient DB, in addition to my wife, of course, who were in Turin for testing sessions. It was the first time I was given the opportunity to test one blindside patient, and I still remember the excitement and surprise when we realized, almost online, that the behavioral results were so clear to make statistics almost unnecessary. Certainly, Bea and Larry told me how one can be a serious scientist and still have fun in life, as you can see from this picture. <laughs> this leads me to the final but sensitive matter, Larry's sense of humor. Only those who know him personally can understand the pleasure and pain of experiencing Larry's humor. During the initial days of my stay in Oxford, I was really depressed in realizing how bad my English was, for I could rarely catch up on Larry's jokes. Then I got partially reassured when I testified the expressions of people in the department, British like the Windsor themselves, lost in confusion or despair when confronted with Larry's jokes. So for example, asking Larry, do you feel tired? You could expect, no, I'm retired as a reply, or ask him, him, how are your feet? Still aching? You will, act, well, he could answer, I do not defeat. In one occasion, his PC was uploading a web page and there was the typical icon with a subscript browsing. I can testify, it took too long for him, so he called IT people to ask whether they could change the subscript from browsing to drowsing. But my favorite one occurred while we were walking and talking 
together at the university parks. I saw a beautiful giant red tree of which I knew the name in Italian because I have one in my garden. I innocently asked Larry, what's the English name for that tree that in Italian is called Faggio? He replied, that is a beach. And you know, sometimes bitches have sons, especially those at the university parks. Uh, it took me two hours of search on Google to understand the joke. But I can tell you that it lays in subtle pronunciation differences between bitch and beach, and their different spellings, and their very different meanings. <laughs> Up to you now to discover. <laughs> Before concluding my speech, I would like to do two more things. First, I would like to deeply thank all the speakers of today for being here despite their very busy agenda. This is a unique day for the neuroscience and psychology in Turin, and we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Second, <laughs> second and final, I grew up in this city, and I always heard people saying that Turin is more like a village than a city, because everybody knows each other. So I'm fond of a quote from one of the greatest Italian writers and novelists from Piedmont, Cesare Pavese, who wrote, Un paese vuol dire non essere mai soli, sapere che nella gente, nelle piante, nella terra, c'è qualcosa di tuo che anche quando non ci sei resta ad aspettarti. By giving to Larry Weisskren the honorary fellowships, we're also telling him that there is something of him in our university from now on. And that when he will be back in Oxford, we will be waiting to welcome him again next time. I hope by now I made clear why we are all standing on the shoulders of a giant, and that giant is Larry Weisskrantz. But now I can hear him saying that we are becoming a bit too heavy and overweighted for his poor shoulders, and time has come to proceed to the awards ceremony. Thank you. Well, the title of this talk, according to Marco, is the first surprises before the others. And uh, I can tell you this is a surprise. Uh, it's a very great honor uh, to be in Torino and to receive such cherished awards. Uh, now, I particularly am pleased because I grew up in an orphanage in Philadelphia. Do you want to stay? Ah, you want to stay now? Yeah. Thank I've, you. Uh, It's the chair of psychology. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in an orphanage in Philadelphia. Uh, and fortunately, I, I think all my colleagues at Gerard College would also agree with me that the standard of teaching was very high, that we were all lucky in many, many respects, and <clears throat> one, uh, I, I knew once I was an orphan that I wanted to go on to university. And a small Quaker college outside of Philadelphia offered me a working scholarship. That is, I had to wait on tables and gradually work my way up until 
uh, I became the assistant of the assistants of uh, important people. I then went into the army because the Second World War was on. Uh, I won't bother you with all the details of that career. Uh, but when I returned to Swarthmore, I came upon another giant, namely Max Wertheimer. And his son told me about psychology. He was my roommate, by chance. Uh, I had started in physics, and then I switched to psychology. Uh, and there's been one surprise after another, after another because I then went, uh, had a fellowship to Oxford, and while I was in Oxford, Cambridge invited me, and then I went back to Oxford as professor of psychology. So that's full of surprises. Uh, and they still occur. <laughs> I think the moral of all of this is choose your friends wisely, choose your location wisely, and good luck. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.